Hey, welcome to the Most Important Game Podcast. I'm Paul Monahan. I help my clients to lead, play, and perform better, struggle less, and enjoy more. Welcome to episode one. Super excited to have a very, very special guest today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our guest, Tim Graves, who is, is with us today. Tim is the co-founder of Graves Golf Academy based in Edmond, Oklahoma, near Oklahoma City. Tim has been in the golf space for over 35 years as a competitive player. Tim is, uh, Tim's been a teaching pro in the, in the PGA system for over 20 years, multiple PGA South Central Teacher of the Year awards, multiple sectional, national, and other level uh, playing accomplishments in, in various formats like match play and medal and group, uh, group team play as well and over 150 tournament wins over the year. So super excited. You know, Tim is not only manages to lead a very successful golf instruction company, along with his brother, Todd Graves Golf Academy, but also finds time to, you know, and the energy to stay extremely competitive in a game that he loves. And especially now that Tim is playing in the, in the over 50 crowd um, mm. as a senior. Right. So anyway, super lucky to have Tim and, and uh, Tim, I want to welcome you to the conversation today. Well, thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Yeah. And it's actually well over 50 now, so. <laughs> but no, I think Paul. And, and, <laughs> just a little and, bit, know, right? Yeah. Just a little bit, <laughs> a few years over 50 now. Um, yeah. It's amazing how, when you, um, you, you can't wait to get that 50 cause you get to move up in the tees and you get to play against those, your age group. You're not playing those, those, seems like 10 year olds anymore out there or 15 year olds what it feels like and then all of a sudden it just flies all of a sudden you're you're pushing to get to 60 yeah so <laughs> i bet but um no i want to thank you paul and um you know i want to give kudos to you we've been me and you know you and i've been doing working together for quite a few years you know and i don't know like way back in fact i mean you started your single plane journey with us years ago and then um yep. found out what you did and the mental game work you did and the in the um, performance you know the the perform the, the space we could really needed the help um, with trying to get the getting guys and thinking better in the golf course and acting better on the golf course and thinking better when they practice and brought you on board and we've been doing some great schools together and some great just great functions together it's been fantastic but in fact we have a what we have a school coming up in June I'm really looking forward to they are our mental game AI school in June yep. so I, I can't wait for that so yeah well thank you for having me of course yeah it and it has it's been it's been almost nine years that yeah, you know, I I wandered out to I wandered out to Prairie Landing Golf Club in um, in um, suburban Chicago, and spent a little a three day with you and Todd and and other, you know, just to to learn this single plane swing. I was like, what is this thing? It looks really cool. I got to try this, right. you know. And I met you guys, and and uh, it's been really a, a terrific ride. So, well, I appreciate you know, that, and it's it's interesting because we um. I remember when you came, I, I don't remember the first time meeting you. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, we, you know, we see hundreds and hundreds of students a year, but I do remember the first time getting involved with you and, and really getting, getting in that headspace. I mean, literally getting in that headspace because I remember thinking every time that you'd start talking about what you work with and who you work with and how you work with them. And, um, I kept thinking to myself, I need this, I need this, I need this. But you do, you do know that we first met, I was pre 50 and now I'm post 50. So, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I know. So you've been involved it. in the pre, you've been involved in the pre and the post. <laughs> no, I totally get that, and I know you and I are. I think we're about a month apart. By the I way, I think we are. Yeah, I think we're yeah. Really close. So, so yeah. we're so, uh, except that your get, your hair is a little grayer that. than mine. I'm just losing mm. on mine. You got twice as yeah. much hair as I have. I just, you just <laughs> <laughs> still got it, right? Uh, yeah, it? I'm losing it all. You still got it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that you talk about the the first time we the first time we met, and I'll tell you a quick story about that. What I remember is that, um, you know, we, you know, you we, we we take the the single plane swing trainer for the first time, and we're trying to hit some positions, right? Right. And it was a group of twenty people, and the the you had given us some directions, and I think we were we took the single plane swing trainer home with us the first night and right. and I'm in the hotel room and I'm trying to get this thing. I'm trying to hit the positions right now. You And the next day, first thing you're like, okay, who's got this thing? You know, who's so right. bold? Right. Who thinks they've got this? And I was like, right. no one's right. I'm like, I, I don't know. I'll give it a shot, you know? <laughs> and you were like, and I go up there and I'm like, you're like, okay, position one, position two, position three. And right. you're like, dang, I was... 
that was pretty good. Uh, right, right. <laughs> then you were like, what do you do for a living? Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah. I'm in coaching. I, you. I, ah, I actually remember you that. Know, there you go. Remember that? I actually remember that. Yeah, I remember that because I usually bring people up there and kind of give them a hard time or harass them a little bit because they think they get it in a few minutes. You know, and it's, it's probably, it is our most important drill using that single plane position trainer. It's one of our top, we always stay top three and maybe the most important, you know, training yeah. device we have. And since it doesn't have a club head on it, it's just got a, you know, our training grip on it. They think, oh, I can get this in two minutes. And then they just throw it aside and they never do it again. And it's so funny because they don't realize that Todd and I, us, who we use it all the time. We use it all the time. But so when I, I brought know. you up there, I remember I'm always sitting there saying, look, you can't hit position zero. And like, oh, zero looks pretty good. Yeah, one looks pretty good. <laughs> Two looks pretty good. It's like, okay, you're not a good example for me. I'm trying to flash judge. <laughs> so sorry, all, right. all the students here that you're not figuring this thing out. No, you're yeah. doing pretty good. So I probably really told you. I probably told you to sit down and bring somebody else up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and then I remember too about that trip that we, um, I, I sat down with you and the rest of the team as it happened at Portillo's. You know, right, right next oh, to yeah, the yeah, right, hotel yeah. there, and we started engaging on some things. So, yeah. That was a, a super fun trip for me and, and, and really part and the beginning of what has been just an amazing journey. And we've I'll actually gone back to the same facility and done mental game schools. We've done AI schools there since actually numerous times. So, <clears throat> You're right. Yeah. We have. Yeah. Yep. So that's been, that's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. You know, it's interesting because I always tell this and I, I love to give this story, but I, this was probably close to almost a year ago now and I was doing a webinar and I got a question. It was a Q and a question and somebody came in and said, what is the what is the quickest way to lower your handicap? That's and they they always say this. You know, what's the quickest way to get in better? What's the fastest? Way? They know, mm-hmm. and you could write. I mean, yeah, you can write books on that, obviously. And um, I remember I sat there and looked at him. I said, you know, I'm gonna throw this out at you right now. I said, if all you did right now was work on your mental game, your short game, and your fitness, your flexibility, your fitness, your flexibility, your mental game, and your and your short game, you cut your handicap in half in literally weeks. I mean, and, and, and I meant by in weeks, I meant by, you know, give me a few months. And I said, and it freaked everybody out. You know, we have thousands of people watch that webinar and it literally freaked everybody out because they came back to me and they really blasted me pretty hard on that. And they said, you never mentioned anything about the full swing. You know, the full swing is so important. You guys make a living out the full swing. I said, no, 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 no. I mentioned everything about the full swing. And they go, what do you mean? And I said, two out of those three categories. In fact, three out of the, those three out of those three categories directly relate to the full swing. And they go, how, what do you mean? I said, mm-hmm. mental game. You got to learn how to practice. None of you guys know, you guys out there get lost when you practice. And mental game is so important when you practice, being in the right mental frame of mind when you practice. We talk about this all the time. Fitness and flexibility. I said, you guys can't hit positions because you're not flexible enough to hit these positions because of our demographic age typically. And you mm-hmm. get frustrated. And then things break down in your head and you literally give up and you get frustrated because you can't hit positions. And then obviously we know how the short cave builds right into the full swing. So I said, it's so funny. They're calling me up and getting so upset at me because I don't mention the full swing. And all three categories were directly related to the full swing. But I always tell them that. You know, we talk about this a lot. But I remember I brought that up. And, then, and since then, we've had a lot of interest in our mental game AI schools. <laughs> a lot of people want to come in. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the, it's so fascinating, too, because, I mean, I'm on this journey to, you know, build my own skills. Right. And we can get stuck in what I call the outside game, right? The game of skill building, right? The, by building our skills on the outside, and it's, hey, look, it's it's kind of a non-negotiable. Like, you know, look, to play well, you have to have some skill, right? So you have to develop skill. Right. But I, the more that the the deeper and deeper I go in this in this whole um, on this on this journey, the more and more I realize that much of whatever struggle I have in skill building is actually, it's a mental game challenge. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's interesting because it never ends. And I'll tell you what I mean by this. You just describe skill building. You're trying to use a mental game challenge to build skills, which I would say is 90, 90 some percent of our students, if not more. But then I'm on the other end of the spectrum. And it's very interesting where I fall in because I have had the skills. Now, they're never perfect. I mean, even taught my brother is not perfect. I mean, you can never be perfect. You can try, think you're close, but you can never be perfect. But now you get to it. And, and I used, was competitive enough that, I mean, I was top 25 amateur in the country at one time. I mean, I'm out there playing with Tiger Woods and, you know, and, and winning many, many tournaments as a young gun and hitting drives 300 plus yards. And here we go. And that was 15, 20 years ago. But now I'm in a position now where I'm losing distance. 
I can't hit the same shots I used to hit when I used to be able to pull off a, <clears throat> a knockdown two iron that could hit 250 yard stinger into the wind. That doesn't mm-hmm. exist anymore. That went away. That went bye bye five, 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. Right, so right. I don't have those same shots. And I'll tell you what, it's interesting how you can become very frustrated when you could pull off those shots at a drop of a hat and you were very competitive with those shots. And now you've got to rely on different parts of the game very significantly because of you start losing distance when you get older. You can't hit those same shots. Your body won't take that amount of practice you used to be able to do. You know, there's all, there's all kinds of factors in that. I mean, I could literally, yeah. I used to be able to go out there for six to eight hours a day and practice in my, in my season without an issue. It was not a big deal at all. I go out there for two hours right now, I'm exhausted. I mean, and I don't consider myself yeah. in bad shape. I mean, I'm, I'm worn out. I mean, I want to get in the phone and talk to work. I'm tired. I'm tired. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, so, you, and, you know, and so it's really funny. I mean, I'm the first one to preach how important the short game is a scoring. But I tell you what, as you get older, it even gets more important to scoring because you start losing. There's nothing you can do when you lose your distance. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you, you can try to keep your accuracy, but let me give you a secret. You ain't going to gain 30 or 40 yards when you're 60 years old, 65 years old, no matter what everybody tells you. You know, I had yeah. a, a very longtime student who's still with us and, and he got really upset with me one day, and he's probably in his early 70s, but now he's probably in his mid-60s when he got upset with me. And he goes, would you stop saying gaining distance and just say maintaining distance to us? Because if all we could do right now is just maintain what we have today, the rest of our lives, we'd be ecstatic. But he, got, he told me, he goes, you're going to quickly realize you're going to lose distance every year because <laughs> you get older, and there's not a dang thing you can do, but help us maintain our distance. <laughs> just, yeah. I remember that conversation I had with him, but you want to talk about a mental challenge. I mean, when I used to hit wedges in the holes, and now I'm hitting eight irons into holes, or not and seven irons into holes, or hybrids into those holes from those same tees, you know. So mentally challenged. Okay, I got to move up on those tees, but still, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's interesting how there's always something out there. To me, there's always when you're playing this game, there's always that massive challenges you're dealing with. Even great players, even good players, even beginners, there's always those huge challenges that deal with between their ears, trying to get to that next level. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's, that's, I love that. To me, as you talk about that, this idea of acceptance comes up, like, you know, there's, you know, so many parts of the, the, you know, what we move through as human beings, you know, we can move through these things and I don't care what realm or domain we're talking about here. Name the performance domain, could be leadership, could be music, could be golf could be another sport the i believe that the faster we get to acceptance the more able we are to make a change and move productively through the moment as it as it unfolds for us i think that's that's like a huge deal no i I think it's massive because then the acceptance it's interesting i'll even take one more step if you if you if you go through the acceptance and say okay I just accept, whatever you want to say it, I accept that I'm not hitting a 280 anymore. I'm only hitting a 250. I accept yeah. that. Okay, let's just say. So I'm not going to go out there for the next two months and three months or four months and say, okay, I got I to get farther. I got to get longer. I'm going to train to get longer. I'm gonna get, and then all of a sudden, you walk three months away and realize I gained three or four yards, which is irrelevant. And I could have spent that time working on my short game or working on my pitching or my chipping or mastering that a little bit more or working on whatever I need to work on. To understand yeah. that to still play very competitively, I need to go even become better in that area. Because now those two par fives that are three par fives I can hit in two, I can't hit in two anymore. So I got 40, 50 yard shots in those things. So guess what? Those shots I never had it, I never had before as a young, young gun. And you never see them on TV. I have a half dozen of those around now. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I need to be working hard on that shot. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, and, and my students out there will freak out in this, but I'll be the first to admit. When I was younger, I'd work on chipping for hours a day. I'd work on putting for hours a day. I didn't work on pitching that much. I didn't have that many shots in the course that required a pitch. Because even right. on even on medium to short par fours or long par fours, I'd have a wedge, you know, 100, 110, 130, 140 in, not a pitch. And a par fives would get home in two. So I wouldn't I wouldn't set my let myself a pitch. So that that shot was kind of oh do you work on it? But it was kind of it wasn't really relevant. Now I may have that thing a half dozen times around. You know, so it just yeah. changed. So I got to accept I'm not going to be hitting those par fives in two anymore. It just doesn't happen anymore. I just, I can't do it. Yeah. And I used to, I, and, that, and that's what we talk about over muscle in a golf course. Young guns will out muscle a golf course and you watch it. You know, the par fours or par fives are basically par fours for them or, you know, or par 4.5s. Mm-hmm. So they step in that first team. It's a par 68 to par 70, no matter what. Let me give you a secret. Very few 50 year olds can do that. 
55, 60 year olds ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? It's just right. not. And right. so that's it. And I love that term you say acceptance because once you put that in your head, you just accept that you can't do that anymore. You're not even going to try. Just go work on what you need to work on. You're now go build those other strengths or, other, or work on those other weaknesses. And that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Yeah. That, I love that. That's, that's fantastic. So uh, as, as I thought about our time together today, I, I thought, all right, I'm, I want, I'm very curious about how golf started for you and kind of, you know, <laughs> I, and I think our listeners are going to be, you know, perhaps interested to hear some of that cool. too. So I'd like to kind of go back and have you just kind of talk through like, how did this all start for you? What, what you know, how did you well, find golf? What's your origin kind of story, story in golf? Yeah, yeah. We, my father moved us to Southern Illinois University, Southern Illinois, down in um, Carbondale, Murfreesboro area, because he got accepted a job at Southern Illinois University. And my brother and I, I think we were 11 and 12 at the time. And we literally, being those, you know, running around the neighborhood, you know, shooting the BB guns out, because we kind of half lived <laughs> outside the edge of the country a little bit. Yeah. And we lived across the pond, and it wasn't a lake. Because I've been back to it now. And it, as a kid, you think it was this massive it lake. No, it was a pond. It was a not even a big pond. It was a pond. We lived across the pond from a golf course. It was, a, it was actually a private country club. And we had no association with it. <clears throat> but our neighbor down the street, his name was Eddie Hamilton. I'll never, I, I'll, I'll never forget his name. He lived down the street and, and um, right backed up to the pond. He would take a canoe out about once a week. And he'd canoe across the pond. And he'd shag golf balls out of the pond. They'd walk waist deep no in water and mud and put it, and we'd literally, I'd do it with them. We had a blast. And we'd fill up the canoe till it almost sink with these muddy golf balls. And That's then we'd good. bring it and we'd drag it back across the pond. I remember you couldn't get in the canoe because it would sink. So you, I'd be in the front, he'd be in the back, or Todd would be around that. And we'd push it back across this pond back to his house. Then we'd wash up the golf balls and we'd sell some that were good. So the good ones we'd sell back to the country club. The bad ones we'd hit back into the pond. We just pound him in the middle of the pond. <laughs> so we'd sit in his backyard and pound him. Well, his neighbor, next, I mean, I'd use Eddie's clubs. I mean, I didn't have any, or maybe we're using his dad's clubs. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, the neighbor next to him was an older couple. And they saw us one day and he came over and he gave me a set of his clubs, an old set of clubs in his garage because probably feel sorry for him. He said, here, he goes, you need to hit these because you don't have any clubs. You need to, if you're going to want to play this game, here you go. Yeah, and yeah. so we I took the clubs. And um, we just, and so we'd sit there, we'd go down to Eddie's and we just pound balls into the lake and then we'd go shag some more, we'd pound them back into the pond. And then it eventually came down to next to my, our house, we had an open lot. It was about two acres, maybe, maybe about an acre, acre and a half anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd go out there and take the mower out and cut golf balls in it. And I remember I'd take tuna cans, I'd bury them in the ground and I'd put a flag up in there, some type of stick or something. And I'd go back and forth in this little field, going back and forth, playing my own little holes over there. And I did that. We played that about a year, year and a half till we moved away from there. And so, so, you, wait, so in that space, you would like carve out little golf holes. Oh, little par threes. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, little, little par threes. threes. Yeah. So oh, I'd make a tee box. I'd make a little fairway, make a green, cut it out with a mower after I'd mow a yard. And I'd hit back. And then I'd make like two par threes back and forth. Oh, yeah. So we played, so we played a little hole there. Never got in the country club. Never got on it. Um, I have since, because I've gone back to visit our old house and I went in there and I, Played it, and in fact, come to find out, it was a little short, little six thousand yard country. It wasn't very much of a course. I thought it was yeah. unbelievable, and that that of pond course. was on a hard dog leg left par five that was sloped into the pond. So now I know why there was so many stinking golf balls uh, in yeah, it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like it's like the hardest hole in the course. So but anyway, um, I had no idea at the time. And then when we came to Oklahoma, we moved after a, about a year, year and a half from there. We came to Oklahoma, and my dad brought us to the golf course because he knew we had interest in golf. And he enrolled us in what's called the Wonder Program. And the Wonder Program was the program. Uh -huh. There's a wonderful program. It's still ongoing here. That they bring kids in that are like between 12 and 16 years of age. They bring them into the course. You work basically five hours a week. And it's a you work as somebody sweeping the floors, sacking tees to sell. You know, whatever the pro doesn't want to do, you do. Okay. <laughs> whatever the pro behind the shop, go clean the toilets, whatever it is. He's having the Wonders do it. And then for working that five hours a week, you got free golf, you got half off your food, you got to hit free range balls um, at certain times and golf at certain times. But so we had a wonder pack. It was the it was a rat pack that lived there, that was there. And I did that all the way through high school. I did that till I was 16 years old where I can work there. Then I started working there. And so I did that from the time I was basically 12 until, um, and we'd literally ride bikes the course, get there at seven o'clock in the morning and stay till eight o'clock at night. That's what we did, you know, in the summers or after yeah. school every day. Yeah, and that's so. And my that, best friends in the world were met through that 
through that organization, the Wonder Organization. Yeah. No way. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, the, all right. So that explains something for me. What's that? All right. So you and your brother Todd are two of the hardest working people I know. <laughs> and well, I, I appreciate think, that. Oh yeah. Oh, no, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's true. I think that that comes from your dad saying, Hey, I'm not going to, you're not getting this. You're going to work yeah. for this. Oh, like yeah. he taught you at a very young age. And I think your mom oh, no, was the my, same way too, right? The work ethic came from my father. My father yeah. pounded that into us. And my father passed away last October. So he's, he, and he, but he, he pounded that into us. I mean, if at seven o'clock in the morning, you were not a bed, he was beating on your back window. You got to mow the grass before you go on the golf course today. You <laughs> yes. got to mow the grass and we were taking our bike. How fast can we get out of here to go to the golf course? And yeah, get yeah. To the golf course. That was our hideout. But oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, yeah. That's, and we, and you had to, it's interesting because we had that group, but I don't remember much work in there. I mean, I do. I remember what we did, but I don't remember a lot of the work. I just remember being on the golf course and playing nine holes for a candy bar, playing nine holes for, yeah. we used to play for those what are those um, little drumsticks or a hamburger or something, you know, we, and it was a big right. deal. And there's, you know, 10 or 12 of us out there playing for a burger and just, it was, and that's all we did. And just, and never and walked hundred degrees out. Didn't matter. We were going at it, you know? And yeah. Oh yeah. And that's it great. was interesting because they had 36 holes there and they'd usually let the, the kids go out on the worst nine or the worst 18 of the holes. But because it wasn't, it, it taught you golf. I and mean, when you're hitting off dirt, you know, into a 40 mile an hour wind, let me give you a little secret. And you're playing for a burger. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> There's a lot on the line. <laughs> or a candy bar or a Twinkie. It's a big deal. <laughs> that is a big freaking deal. <laughs> a big, yeah. big deal. Yep. Yeah, that's So that's that was, great. yeah, oh yeah. And that's what we did. Did that for all the way through high school. Yep. So. When did you realize you could play well? Um, You know, probably I used to play in a lot of, we called golf ink events in Oklahoma. Um, they're just local events that the different municipal courses are put on. But then they have the Oklahoma City Amateur, which is all of anybody can play in it, but it's mainly people from Oklahoma and Oklahoma City. And it's a big event. Yeah. I mean, there's hundreds of hundreds of people in that and you qualify for it and everything else. And I won it one year. And, and uh, most of the people that play in this were the college players. Um, and I was young at the time, were college players or they were um, the, the semi-pro guys or the, you know, the older guys, the country clubs that play in this. And I won it, I think I won it in 91 or 92, whatever it was, in the, early, in the early 90s. And at that time, I played a lot of junior events and things. But when I won that, I was playing against the big boys. And I played it a few years and did okay. But when I won that, I thought, you know, I probably could play this game. I mean, like I could get to the next level if I wanted. But I'm also that guy that if somebody can beat me, I'm just going to figure out a way to beat him. I'm just, I'm not going to, it's, I'm not going to take it. I don't care if it's Tiger Woods. I'm going to figure out a way to try to get better than him. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to go figure it out. So I've never thought I couldn't play, um, but I've always looked up to people that I thought could play better than me and try to figure out what, how, what they were doing, you know, and try to nice. match that or get at least pat or at least to that. Yeah. Okay. So that, that win in 91 was a pretty important moment. That was pretty influential. Yeah. I mean, and then I ended up, it's interesting. I ended up winning the Oklahoma City Amateur four years in a row and nobody had ever done that. So, you know, it's like I won it. Then I would said, okay, somebody had won it three years in a row. I said, I'm, I, I want to win this thing four years in a row. I want to set a record. And nobody's done it since. So I, and that was in the 90s. So no one, and I don't think anybody ever will. But I won it four years in a row. In fact, I, the fourth year I won it, I qualified for the Sonny Hanna winning the state amateur championship, which is a very prestigious national event. <clears throat> and I skipped it to win the city amateur the fourth year. Some people thought I was oh, nuts. Wow. Why aren't you going this major championship that literally Tiger Woods is playing in or those type of guys? And I didn't I stay home because I wanted to set a record. <laughs> I mean, I grew up, you know, this city amateur trophy would go around to the different courses. You know, you're big, it's a huge trophy. Your name gets put on it. Well, when I was a junior, that thing would pop in every so often at our course. That was a big deal. And I wanted to get my name in that trophy. And then I wanted it four times in a row in that trophy because I knew that would never go away. I mean, and there's boom, 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 boom. You know, because when you're looking back, uh -huh. when I'm now, when kids are looking back and that happened 30 years ago, they're going, Who's this guy who's on your four times? It's like, is that a mistake? So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, Did they run out of letters. <laughs> I don't know who that is. So, anyway. So, yeah. Those that poor was guys. They, the guys that won after that guy, Tim Graves, they all yeah. spelled their name the same way. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to make sure they're on the same side, too. I didn't want to wrap around the other side. They'd been upset. I'd never know. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, I, 
that's all. I did not know that. That's so. What, how do you? How do? What was it like? Um, as you as you were trying to win for the fourth time, mm-hmm. what was the pressure like, if any? What was that <laughs> feeling like? Well, I think I think I've told yeah, I've told the story a lot in classes. The fourth time I won, it was very very unique. It was a very unique situation because it's a four round event. It's it's a city amateurs. So they take the four Oklahoma City public courses. Um, and which is four, there's more than four, but there's four big ones here. The big, the yeah. bigger ones that have hundreds of rounds a day mm-hmm. and you play all four. So you're not stuck in one course. So they're trying to get the best player, you know, you, it's, it's equal. It's like, cause you know, if, if, if I only played at one course and that was happened to be the city amateurs in that course, it'd be the advantage of that person. We well, play around in every city course. So it's four rounds of four different courses. And, um, the last fourth year, which I really wanted to win it. Cause I, I didn't, I hadn't decided to go pro yet, but I thought that I was probably going to do something next up. And so I really wanted to win this tournament. But anyway, yeah. I um, I went out and the first two rounds were at two courses I was pretty good at. I mean, there's one I'm not, one I'm real good at, and two that were average. And the two average courses I play, I shot, I think I believe like 70, 71, whatever it was. I, w- I remember I was like one under par or maybe even whatever it was. And I was back quite a bit. I think it was nine or 10 shots back. And... There's a Saturday, Sunday, then you play the next Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And I was okay. a lot back, but the problem was on Sunday afternoon, I had to hop on a plane and go to the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, because yeah, when as an amateur, you're working full time. And I was working as the Oklahoma state epidemiologist. That was my job at the time. So I hopped on a plane on Sunday night and flew to Atlanta, Georgia for at that time was HIV testing and training. It was the next level of it. That's what I was highly involved with and for surveillance and so on of that in Oklahoma. And so if I hadn't been going there, I can promise you I would have been spending four or five, six hours a day practicing in between, uh, you know, before yes. work, at lunchtime, at night, getting, try, going to those next courses. But I had to go to the CDC. And this is kind of a long story. But anyway, <clears throat> the first day I go to the CDC, I brought my clothes with me thinking, all right, four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to buzz out of here. I'm going to go practice for a couple hours. So I got the next two rounds next week and I got to win this tournament. And I went out and anybody who's listening from Atlanta, Georgia knows this. And I've never been so bad in my life. I looked up on the map to go to this nice golf course up the road and go practice, called up the golf course on Sunday afternoon when I got to Atlanta. And they said, yeah, coming out, practice, no big deal, blah, 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 blah. So I hop in my car and drive up. And in Oklahoma, mile markers are done by the mile, like mile 10. And then the next marker, 12, 20 will be an exit. You know, okay, so it's 20, 10 miles between. In Atlanta, they're done by the, the marker. So if you go from 120 to 140, there's 20 exits in between. It's not 20 miles. And I didn't know that. So I literally drove a hundred miles up the road to get to this course in Atlanta. And when I got there, it was dark. Okay. So oh. I'm livid. Okay. So, so I didn't, didn't realize that. Okay. So no practice on Monday. Okay. So yeah. now things are even getting worse. So I come back and on Tuesday, I go to the worst range in the face of the earth, which was in downtown Atlanta. It's the only one I could get to next to the CDC. Nasty golf balls, nasty range, cost oh, 40 geez. bucks a bucket. It was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and I, st- but here's what I did. I started, I knew the two courses I was going to play. I knew them like the back of my hand. So I started mentally playing those courses in my head, hitting shots. So I wasn't working on my swing. I literally would tee up a drive, hit a drive, think, okay, that's number one. It's a dog leg right, par five or par four, 400 yards. Okay. You got 130 left into the green. I'd pull it a nine iron, I'd hit it. And I'd say, okay, you're 20 feet right. Boom. Now I play the next hole. If I missed a green, I'd chip on the range. I mean, I literally would grab a bucket of 20 or 30 balls or 40 balls and play this yeah. golf course in an hour or two. Then I'd go putt in the green, which wasn't a very good green. I'd go back to the hotel at night. And I did that on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And I remember that because I drove people crazy because this range was packed full of people. And I'm sitting there doing pre-shot routines and post-shot routines and setting up over every shot and literally playing these two golf courses in my head, which is very interesting because it's exactly the opposite I would have done if I would have had the time. I guarantee you, if I would have been at home, I would have been pounding hundreds and hundreds of golf balls trying to get ready, yeah. but I did, couldn't do it. So I come back. So I go to Friday, go to the deal and get this out at noon. I came back on Friday, flew back home, got home that night, got to go to the range for about an hour, hit balls kind of the same way. Got up Saturday morning, played the two golf courses on Saturday. I shot five under par. And on Sunday, I ended up shooting nine under par and tied a competitive course record and won the tournament by nine shots. So I was actually down by, I believe I was down by 10 going into the last two rounds and one by nine. I made up 19 shots in the last two rounds. And in my mind, 
at that time thought I had the worst practice sessions in the history of practice in that week. Mm. And then as we have discussed many times in our schools and our things and talking to you, they were truly the best practice sessions I could have put in that week because I put myself in the perfect mental state. I remember walking on the first day of that course and I wasn't nervous. I was sitting there thinking, I played this course 30 times this last week. I played it 20 times this last week. This is not a big deal. Like I just played this over and then come to find out. And I've read a lot about what Tiger did since then. And Tiger would do this for the week leading up to tournaments. He'd do the same thing with Stevie on the range. Didn't know it at the time, had no idea. But he's written about that a lot. And um, so, yeah, so that's, and I ended up winning the fourth time at the city amateur, thinking with a panic attack going into it. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's great. I've heard you tell that story before. I didn't know the the relation. So I I love that story. That's why it was such a big deal because of the fourth year of the city city amateur. If, If it would have been a normal tournament, I would have tried hard, obviously, but this was the fourth one. This was the fourth one I wanted to win. So yeah, that's why it was yeah, such a big deal. It meant it meant a lot. No, that's yeah. that's great. And this idea of gamifying on the range, man. We you know I know we, I know we talk about this in our in our schools. It's um, yeah. huge. It is so unbelievably powerful. Huge. And I'm thinking yeah. about there's a famous um, I'll call it a case study from one of the prisoners coming out of the Hanoi Hilton back in in the Vietnam era. And, um, and I, I, the story's out there, I forget all the details, but the, the upshot is that, you know, this was, this was a, you know, a prisoner of war, you know, in captivity for like three years or four years, whatever right. it was, a long time. And what he committed to doing was, you know, playing this, the courses that he knew over right. and over and over again in his head. And I think he came back and like, his, his handicap was lower than when he, you know. Right, he was... The, the story the story I've heard is he was a scratch golfer basically, so he was already a phenomenal player, good okay, player. Gotcha. And he came back and he lo- didn't lose one shot. He was still a scratch golfer on a plate. And any average golfer would have they had walked back. They had got back eventually, but they had been a 10, 12, 15 handicap. I mean, they had lost 15, 20 shots. But the, the, I remember the thing reading about that story a little bit. And we've talked about the story a lot. Was he wouldn't just play a quick round of golf in his head. He would actually think about the round for four hours. Yeah. So he would sit in that prison cell and say, okay, and he'd hit a shot in his mind. Then he'd think himself walking to the ball, getting mm-hmm. over the next shot, thinking what he's looking at, thinking. So, cause he said, that's how he could survive. So instead of being in that isolation, cause you remember this was the one that was in isolation so much. And he'd sit there and say, and being in that isolation, he literally would take him and he'd spend that amount of time playing rounds of golf in his head. And he said, that's how he survived. Cause he was, so, and he, obviously he was a great golfer previous to that, but he, he did it because he was he could get into that game and not actually play the game. And that's basically, I mean, I, there's no way, I can't even compare to what I did in Atlanta like to that, but it's kind of the same wavelength. And the fact that I, yeah. I the mm-hmm. best preparation I could have done was mental preparation in between. It had nothing to do with hitting balls. It was mental preparation. Mental, and I, and I thought back a lot, what would have happened that week? And honestly, I've said this, what would have happened that week if I would just pounded balls in between and just worked on my short game and long game and pounded balls in between like I normally would have? Yeah. And, you know... I hope I would have won, but I wouldn't have won by that much. There's no way. Because I remember I was being interviewed by the, um, by, we have a, his name's Mac Bentley, and he runs, writes, writes for the paper, still does write for the paper. He's been doing it for 40 years in Oklahoma, and Mac's a great, mm-hmm. great, great guy. And Mac was walking down the 72nd hole with me, and my wife was with me, and I was walking, we were walking down the hole, and my group was there, and I was walking down the hole to go to the green. It's a dog leg left par five, little short par five, and I, he, and I hit my second shot up on the green. And he normally wouldn't bother me. I know him back very well, but he walked up to me in the middle of the fairway because, I mean, he knew where I was. He knew how much I was up. And so he started walking with me. And he goes, he goes, why are you still grinding out here? He made that comment. He goes, like, he was like, you're like ultimately grinding. And he goes, you're up by like nine. And I looked at him and I go, <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, I want to win by double digits. And I walked yeah, I'd like green. 10. <laughs> no, you don't know. That's what I said. And I, yeah. ended up, I ended up burying the hole. And I said, I won by nine, I believe. I didn't win by double digits, but I won by nine. And that's all Matt yeah. could write in the paper. Graves wants to win by double digits. It's like, it's like, 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 like real sarcastic. But, but I said, he goes, it was stupid. He goes, it was crazy. Um, and then Mac one time interviewed me and I was playing a match against Jim Woodward. And um, this was when I was a senior in the section championship. And um, Jim Woodward's an old PGA Tour player who I still play with. He's actually a good friend of mine still. And he's a great guy. He's, he won on the PGA Tours, played, made, he's made many, he's played years and years in the tour until he hurt himself. But anyway, I was playing him in a section match play up in, in Kansas and was in the mass, last match. And I remember Jim was there and I remember Jim was playing this and Jim was a phenomenal player. I mean, he's a phenomenal player. And I knew if I met him in the finals that I'd have to be on my A plus, here we go game. Like, yeah. you can't miss a shot or you're going to lose this match. 
And I remember I got in a hole. It was number two, dog leg right. And this is how good Jim is. He hit a right of the fairway in kind of these trees. And there's a pond short of the green. The pond goes right up the front edge of the green. Now, there's no rocks or anything. It kind of is just a pond in front of the green. And I hit a perfect shot in the middle of the fairway. And I wedged it up there like 10, 15 feet. I remember this hole. And Jim's dead in the trees. And I'm like, he's got to chip out the fairway. And so I'm like, man, I mean, he's got to get up and down from 130 yards inside the pond. He walks over the side of the, of the thing, punches out from the tree, skips it across the lake, and hits it three feet. Skips it over the water. Skip, 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 skip. Like you see it at Augusta on 16. Yeah. Bop, 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 and yeah, it goes up by the hole. And I'm like, awesome. I'm looking at him like, oh, okay, unless you're you. I, I, I got I to play. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, what? I just yeah. go from winning the hole. To, I just lost the hole. You know, okay. But long story made short in this. I played phenomenally. In fact, I don't know my score, but I was probably eight or nine under for 14 holes. And on the 14th hole, um, <clears throat> I'm walking down it and a mat comes up because he knew it was there. And he was going to be us in 17 or 18, <clears throat> but he heard the match where he saw where the match was. So he met us in 13 or 14. And he comes out and he's in the middle of the fairway watching me, apparently. I played the hole out. And I remember I'm like five, 10 feet from the hole putting for birdie and Jim's like 20 feet from the hole putting for birdie. And if we tie the hole, the match is over. And Jim looks at me and, he, and the rules officials with this and he goes, I have to win this hole to continue the match. And the guy goes, yeah. And Jim picks up his ball and goes, let's have a beer. I'm done. Oh, and he just picked gee. up his ball. And I conceded it because oh. I was five feet for birdie. He's 20 feet for birdie. He's like, I'm done. I'm done. And that's yeah, how he goes yeah. playing. Right. Well, right, Mac right. bent me, grabbed me after the match. And I'm walking off the green and he goes, you didn't even see me, did you? And I go, what? And he goes, no. He goes, I've been following you for the last two or, three, two or three holes right next to you. And you've looked right through me every time. And I'm like, and I'm like, he goes, that's how heavy focused you were. He goes, you didn't even see me. He goes, you just, yeah. he goes, and you stayed, looked at me, but you looked right through me. And I did, I didn't even know he was out there. So you talk about focus on a golf course. I had to put myself in that state in that match. I remember, I remember, and honestly, it's funny, but it's probably the least amount of shots I remember in a match. I can't remember one or two shots. And I hit, I played great. I mean, I played great, but I was just hyper-focused on shot to shot to shot. Knowing yeah. if I didn't make birdie, I was losing the hole. You know what I'm saying? I'm losing them. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but yeah, I'll, I'll never forget yeah, that. But that's another Mac that. story. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I. Yeah. The whole idea of focus is. Yeah. Is a is a is a really great conversation. I I love the you know, there's there's a great conversation. Um, and I think I reference it in in the book. Yeah, I tell the story. It's the it's the Phil Mickelson, elongating my focus story, which was the it was the really one of the key reasons why he won in in Kiwa Island. Uh, he won the PGA in Kiwa Island because he actually spent about three months ahead of that, you know, just working on his focus because he felt like his focus was slipping. Right. And right. Um, I think that's a powerful lesson for all of us. Um, I'm curious, Tim, when have you struggled in your game? Hmm. Wait, it's interesting. People ask that. And you, I mean, it's like Mo Norman or even Todd or myself or great players. I, mean, I play at the greatest players in the world. I, mean, I always talk about, you know, I get to practice with Javi, Victor Hovland, and Matthew Wolf and these guys. I mean, the greatest of the greats now. And, and the, what people don't realize is golfers, the better you get, the more you struggle. And I don't, and I don't think that the average golfer comprehends that. And they get, sometimes I've brought that up to average or some of my students, and they actually get mad at you for saying it. Like, what do you mean you struggle? You hit it so good. You know, they get upset with you. Like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Because when you start, you struggle. Because like I brought up earlier, <clears throat> you <clears throat> you had the game or you know you can play these shots or you it's something you should be able to do, but for some reason you're not pulling it off right now or you're not doing it right now or you're missing five footers that you're supposed to be making or I get up and down 90% of the time, but all of a sudden I'm not getting up and down you know, 75% of the time and it's driving you crazy. Mm -hmm. you know? So all of a sudden <clears throat> you go out and play a, a round of golf and you go out and, and you should have carted one or two under and you shoot two or three over. Because you those up and down shots or whatever it is that you or should be routine for you aren't. And so the struggle comes in the fact that you feel like, am I not putting in the time? Am I losing it? Mm -hmm. Um, is it is it if it is am I mentally losing it? Is am I physically losing it? Why can't I do this anymore? You see I'm getting here. And I'm sure yep. it's a combination of all of it. But that's where the struggle is because it's like, I don't know how to, you, you know, I how do I find it again? And maybe it was just a matter of <clears throat> unlimited time, unlimited courage, you know, too dumb to know better. I don't know what it was when you're younger. You know, you always see those juniors that yeah. go out there and make those 20, 30 foot putts. And you always, and the old saying is they'll wise up someday and get double the green <laughs> because know. they'll they realize those better. aren't easy putts to make. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
They just don't and know. Never that. go. Don't never go play that? a ten year old or twelve year old that plays golf in a putting game because they're too dumb to lose. You know what I'm saying? It's like they think they can make twenty and thirty footers, and you're too scared to three putt. You know, so you know, so I think that's when the game really. That's what you constantly go back and forth with. You know, because it's yeah. interesting. You no, know, it's when you had it one. You, you never lose the recall of what you had. You know, you know, I can mm-hmm. tell you some shots I hit that even amazed me. It's like, you know, the high cut three woods from 250 and stopped on a dime. It's like, whoa, you know, how did I hit that shot? But I try it and I did it that was 20 years ago. I remember them. You know what I'm saying? I can yeah. remember them. Right, right. And now I couldn't, in my dreams, I hit that. I mean, I couldn't hit that shot in any, that's good shots long gone, long gone. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. And so when you struggle is when you're sitting over that shot right now going, I spoke a place. I could do this. I could do this. But now I got to lay up to that right side of the green, try to get up and down. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's when I, that's a lot of struggle you see now. Their thing is struggle is the fact that as we get older, you know, the body just isn't going to work the same. It just can't. And there's just some, some days you have good days and some days you got bad days with the body. Sorry, but it just happens. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And, 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 you know, some days you're tight. And, and, and when you were younger, you could work your way through it. Even working more through the pain and the aches and whatever as you get older, not happening. It's not happening. And so um, you just got to accept that. You got to accept there's good and bad days. The, the problem is when you struggle is when you go out on that golf course and it's a tournament, your one tournament you have this month, and it's not a good day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Whereas before, when I was playing professionally, I might play, honestly, when I played like in the Dakota Tour, I played 16 or 17 events around a month. It didn't matter. If you have 10 bad days, it didn't matter. You yeah. have three or, four, three or four good ones. And you see that with the PJ Tour players. They're playing every weekend. But all of a sudden, you play once a month, and uh, and you're not having a good round or two. You struggle. You struggle with that. You know why can't I figure this thing out? It's because you're putting too much pressure on that one round or those two rounds or that one tournament. And so I, you see that struggle. You know when you start playing less events, and I've seen a lot of that in Todd. In fact, a lot of great players will just give up the game playing and get into other areas of the game because that's a struggle for them because they don't want to go out there and make that one round so important that they you know they get too nervous for it when they used to play and play and play and play. So I see, I see struggles there. Yeah. That, and that's a great point in the, the idea that, look, um, if you put too much importance on yeah. the member member coming up or, right. you know what I mean? Like, you know, we see that a lot right. in, 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 you know, our students, right. They, they, they just, they just put so much meaning on the round yep. that they're playing. Yeah. Right. And, and they can prepare for it different ways, but, you know, I can give a perfect example of this. I used, I play, I used to play in the Oklahoma Open, which is a, it is actually was the third largest mini tour event in the United States. I mean, you'd have the Bob Tways, the Willie Woods, the Scott Verplanks, and these guys would be on a tour playing and winning tour events, and they come in and play this. In fact, if you look at the trophy, there's many past tour winners on that trophy. So oh, sure. you play in that thing, and, and the top amateurs in the state would get an invite. <clears throat> so from the early 90s all the way up, I'd always play in it. So 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 90, I'd play in it. And I'd, I'd, I'd get, get an invite. If you didn't get an invite, you had to qualify for it. It was a hard qualifier. It was like qualifying for, you know, buy.com or a Q school or a corn fairy event. It was very difficult. At that time, first place check was like 30000 which is huge for that time. I mean, it was huge. That'd be like having a mini tour event worth 200000 first place now. That's how big it was. But anyway, yeah. as an amateur, and I was a top amateur, I'd play in it and I'd just try to make the cut. I was just, I mean, it was so hard. And I was just trying to make the cut or finish top 20. You know, they cut, there's 120 guys in the field and they cut to the top 30 or 35, you know, going into Sunday. And I just trying to make the cut and trying to get top 20 or 30. And then in, in, I turned professional in, nine, in 98, or it was actually 97, I turned professional. Um, and I started going and playing literally every week. You know, I was playing in mini tour events, trying to qualify for PJ tour events, trying to qualify for buy.com tour events, getting into some buy.com events, playing in a lot of events. And I came back and played in the Oklahoma Open. And it was such not a big deal because I'd played at so many big events before that. Mm-hmm. And for out of the next six years, I finished second four times. Never won it. And there's a lot of stories behind that, but I can give that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> but but it is duly noted. Duly yeah. noted, yeah. Big another podcast, yeah. But yeah, another podcast. um I um I finished second four times and should have won it twice and literally wasn't going for me, trying to make the cut was like I should be winning this thing I should be, and when I walked in the first season like this is like a small event for me this isn't even a big deal anymore it's like this is like playing yeah. in my backyard and I was like who cares it was like I, I, well, I cared a lot about it and all my buddies were there and the, you know all my guys but it just changed it to being this is not a big deal and loving it 
and loving it. Yeah. So, that's which is right. kind of interesting because then it flipped when I stopped being a mini tour player and I stopped play, being a section tour player and only playing one event a week, maybe one or two a month. I went back and played in Oklahoma and it became a really big deal again. I, my nerves came <laughs> back. So, so it went both directions. It did. It did. So it yeah, literally went both directions. That. Like, yeah. And you see these guys on tour doing this. That's why they can play so good at times week in, week out, because they'll miss cut, miss cut, and then they'll win. They'll miss cut, miss cut, and they'll win. And well, how do they do that? Because these one term is not bigger than the next. But it's also why you see the the really cream rise to the top, the cream like rising to the top in the majors. Yeah. Because these guys all make the majors the huge events. And the phenomenal players know how to make those a normal event. They, so, yeah, so they're so, the, the really, 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 really elite of yep, the elite know how to make are normalizing. The yep. Yeah, Tiger normalizes those events. He does not make, yep. so he's not going to sit there and talk about the Masters for four months before and go, I can't wait for the Masters. Oh my God, I can't wait to get there. We won't even know if Tiger's going to play in the Masters until two weeks before or three weeks before. We will not know. And there's a reason for that because Tiger will not announce it because he's not going to put in his head whether he's going to play it or not. Now, we're all going to assume he is. Oh, yeah, why would he miss it? But he right now is thinking in himself, I'm not sure if I'm playing it or not. If I'm healthy, I might. He's put that in his head right now. It's not that big a deal. And maybe mm-hmm. two or three weeks before he'll announce, yes, I am or no, I'm not. Okay. And yeah. you know why? Because he normalizes that event. Whereas yeah. all these other guys, these juniors out there, all these great players that are phenomenal that are trying to get to the top, can't wait to get there. They've been thinking about it since January. They walk in that first tee, they're going to be so nervous compared to the guys that have been there before. It's unbelievable. So, and that's a huge deal. That, that In fact, yeah. that's the biggest deal for those guys. That's the biggest deal. I often, and it's I the love same it. thing you see. It's also the same reason. You'll see some young gun will play unbelievably the first or second round. He'll shoot it's course record. And you're like, and he'll be leading by four or five. And you're like, this guy should win the tournament. And he's going to go home and sleep on it. And he's going to think in his head, I could be the master's champion. And he's going to walk out the third day and shoot an 80 or a 79 yeah. or 78 because he's actually right. going to get ahead of himself. And he's going to think, I could be wearing that green jacket. And a great player wouldn't do that. A great player is going to figure out how to play shot to shot, day to day, you know, one, mm-hmm. one, one shot to shot and not think about what's going on. You know, I'm not looking at the leaderboard. I don't care about the leaderboard. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge deal. And that's a learn, that is learned technique. That is learned Yep. You don't do that naturally. You have to teach yourself to do that. It it that is a skill, just yep. like learning how to putt or chip or yep. hit a full swing. In yeah. fact, no doubt. it's a harder skill to learn how to putt or chip. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I agree. Why I go it's to hard. You. <laughs> well, and you know, look, I you know, I swim in these waters all the time. Yep. And um, you know, maybe we'll get my wife Paula on a podcast at some point. She can talk about how uh, you know. I yep. miss the mark sometimes on uh, on this stuff. I'll get my wife on the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, but it's it's like, yep. I, you know, sometimes people will be like, oh, you know, but, y- you know, you've got this stuff figured out. I'm like, ah, oh, man, the only reason why I spend time writing about this stuff. So here's a, you know, there you go. There it is. Yep. Um, this yep. moment is sponsored by. <laughs> there you go. Um, but th- I think the real reason why I spend time writing about this stuff it's because I stink so bad at, it, yeah. you know, or yeah. you know, like I struggle so much you're, with it, and so that's why you have to. You're, you, it get intrigues reps. you, yeah. Yeah, it's that challenge. Yeah. It intrigues you. It intrigues you. Yeah, there's no doubt. And yeah, and, and that's your point. You, you got to practice it. You know, it's interesting because it's like you know, golfers under they whether they know what it, know whether they've been in it or not, they understand the zone on the golf course. Yeah. And any good player has found the zone. He may not have been in the entire round. He may have been a part of the round or for a few shots. But it, there's nothing more addictive on the golf course than getting in the zone. And it's not easy to find. It's not yeah. easy to get there. You know, it's that subconscious, internal, not thinking, reacting on the golf course. Okay. And it's not easy to find. But once you find it, it's the most addictive thing. There, I guarantee you to a golfer, and I wouldn't know about drugs and alcohol and so on, because, but I can guarantee you it's as addictive. Okay. <laughs> because there's, there's a strong what, pull. There, that's what great players or good players are looking for. Yeah. Is trying to get in those events when they can get in the zone and they're free flowing and things are just happening. That's why yeah. you play the game. And the only way to get there is to be nervous at the beginning or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you get through those nerves and you find that zone and, whoosh, and you're rolling. And yep. it doesn't happen naturally. It's something that you have to work on. It's something that you have to put yourself in there. It's something you have to allow to happen. And when I'm it does, there's nothing better. 
There's you, you're right. You have to be in the arena, the famous. Yep. Um, and it's Teddy interesting because I've seen a bazillion people from good to average to great players be in the zone. And we know, like, I'll be out there playing with a great player and you see him in the zone and he's playing good and you're not. And, you know, pros will tell you, I'm trying to get out of his way. I'm just trying to get out of his way. I don't want to get in his way. In other words, you don't want to interrupt him because you could literally knock him out of the zones, which you could do. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You know, yeah. you know, right. and, and right. unintentionally, but he's in that zone going, you know, he's going and you're just trying to get out of his way and you see it and you see what he's doing and you're craving it. <laughs> you're like, I'm not, I, want, I want to be there. I don't want to be over here. I want to be on that side of the fence, not on this side yeah. of the fence. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Oh, yeah. That's great. Mm. Hey, what I'm curious, you know, cause th this, um, the, the intent of this podcast over mm -hmm. time will be not just to talk about golf, which, mm -hmm. um, I'll go back to the, to the phone cam again. There you go. Of course I'm talking, <laughs> we're talking about golf right now. Right? right. And by the way, I will say this, um, for those of you who have picked up the book and are starting to read it, um, I do want to give a shout out to this guy right here who wrote. Yeah. It took the time, by the way, the forward. and wrote an amazing foreword. And yeah. Tim, I do, I do appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. no, it's yeah, another another great another story, story, right? Yeah, um, but you know, this is this is a podcast that will over the long term be about broadly, you know, many domains, not just golf, right. but in work and in and in maybe music or um, other sports and and so forth. I know you and your brother Todd run this incredible business called Graves Golf Academy. I'm curious what, if any, mental game lessons that you've learned over the years on the golf course translate into the work that you do with your brother and your uh, team. There's a bazillion. I mean, I, I mean, I tell the story a million times with you. I mean, I, I hired you personally to help me with my business because, you know, it's, it's very stressful. I mean, when you have multiple, multiple employees and multiple locations and you're trying to trying to manage that and you know and you know and you're trying to grow it and you're the demand of of working with customers it doesn't matter what the customer is if it's in the golf arena or if it's in the what doesn't matter what arena it's and you're dealing with the customers yeah. and you know and people it's interesting because everybody it's a, you don't know how many times if i had a nickel for every time i heard you have to have your dream job because you're in a golf business if i had a nickel for that i wouldn't be talking to you right now i'd be down in the caribbean floating around in my yacht Okay, down there with my wife floating in a yacht yeah. down there in Turks and Caicos. Because, you know, you're in your dream job. But what you understand is we're in a world where people come to us because they're frustrated or they're hurting. Mm. That's when 90% of golfers come to us is because they're frustrated with their game or their body's hurting. Remember, our typical demographic is 50 years of age or older. It's 95% of the people we deal with is males and females. They have income so they can afford the game now because their kids are all out of college. They think they can go do this. And then all of a sudden, they're taking this body with frustration and coming to us saying, I need help. And when, they, and, when they're get, and when things aren't going the right way, they're getting more frustrated. And now my staff's frustrated. I'm, you know what I'm saying? And I'm trying to help these people. And I'm, trying, and I'm mm -hmm. not talking to help them by just saying, get on the tee with them. I'm just talking life in general, you know, because it just builds up and builds up and builds up. So... We're trying to do a, a, a customer-based service, keeping golfers happy in a very frustrating arena, as you like to say. Oh, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it may be yeah. one of the most frustrating arenas. You know what I'm saying? And, and our goal, and we say this in Graves Golf, is not about making you, it's not about becoming a great golfer, which ultimately we'd love you to do that. But it's to get in a, what we call the 10% group. And there's been numerous studies done in golf, numerous, that shows that when golfers go practice, not typically when the golfer practices, 90% of golfers make themselves no better or worse, only 10% improve. Okay. Yeah. So our goal with Graves Golf, and that's what we call things like the 10% show, you know, we try to get you the 10% newsletter, you know, different things yeah, is to yeah. get you in that 10% group so that every time you practice, you're getting better. Maybe it may be so small, you don't hardly even see it, but you're getting better. Right. Because what the average single golfer does is he or she will now have this time to go do some stuff and have the, you know, economically they can afford it. And then they go and practice and play. maybe sometimes you can practice more than they're practicing their life. You know what I'm saying? Just even a few minutes a day is more than they ever practice. They used to play once a year. Now they're practicing yeah. every couple of days and they're making themselves worse. I mean, how frustrated are you getting where you got all of a sudden have time to do something and now you make yourself worse or your body can't do it. Yeah. That's what we deal with. And we don't deal with it in the tens and twenties. We deal with the hundreds of thousands. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. it's, 
I mean, there's many, many times, like I told you about telling, about making that comment in a webinar and saying, you know, if all you worked on was your short game, your mental game, you know, and your fitness and your flexibility, yeah. I could cut your yeah. handicap in half faster than you can imagine. I literally received within 24 hours over 2,000 emails on that. And Crazy. most of them were telling me I was full of crap. <laughs> Mm. You know, so so you talk about life lessons in business. <laughs> yeah. It's it's saying, okay, take it a chunk at a time, slow it down. You know what I'm saying? Don't get frustrated no with it. I understand there's gonna be some ramifications of what you say, you know, but but that's really, you know, and that's why I dealt with you so much because and I've talked to you and I love talking to you about this because it is the life lessons you gotta do. You gotta look at the big picture. You know, you know, and it's interesting. I, I had a mentor one time who said he, he was kind of one of the original guys that founded Hobby Lobby. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, he, he started it before even the Greens got into Hobby Lobby. And wow. um, I don't know if you remember, you remember, you met Dick Reed. You remember meeting Dick Reed, but he's passed away a few years ago. Yeah, but I don't think I did. Yeah. He ended, he, ended, he ended up founding worldpages.com and he became a multi, multi gazillionaire. And he was just, he, he was kind of mine and Todd's mentor in our business. If there's one mentor, he was it. And nice. he came to me one day and Timmy goes, Timmy, you got to be real careful. I go, what? And he goes, you can build a nice small business that supports your family and does really good and you'll live well. You and your family will do well for years and years and you'll be great. Or you can try to take that next level and you may not make any more money. In fact, you may make less money and you're going to support mm -hmm. a whole lot more people and you're going to increase the stress a hundredfold. He goes, that's what, that's what everybody thinks the dream's all about. And he goes, you got to watch if that's truly the dream you want. You know what I'm saying? Right, and, right. And honestly, I see that a lot. And when I talk about life lessons, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, do I want to go play in that event that's got Victor Hovland and Matthew Wolf stand the first tee? Or do I want to go back to my section event over here where I can beat I can play these guys and I can go beat these guys? You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's kind of life checks here. It's like a reality check because I can do both. <laughs> it's like, but oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. But, um, so we're constantly dealing with that, you know, because we've been very lucky and very blessed to deal with, you know, individuals like you um, and, and built our business that it's big. I mean, we've got, I, 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 there's never any rankings on this, but I've been told we're one of the top two largest golf schools in the country now. Um, at one time we were, and I think we still are top two in like training aids and, and things like that. Yeah. We may be number one. I don't know. I mean, they, they don't really keep good record of that, but um, obviously anyway, was, making a huge impact. Yeah. Big impact. And it's growing. We, we've been doing this now since yeah. the year 2000, and we've grown every year. And there's been some years we've doubled the previous year. So as, as you can tell, I mean, if you're growing, it's almost exponentially now. So and, and that, me, so, yeah. so that's, that's you know, and so that's what you deal with. And, and love it, love of the game. But I'm to the point now, I'm like, what, I'm not going to say what legacy I'm going to leave, but can I eventually consult in this arena and not be doing 19 hours a day of work on this arena? You know, so... Of I'm course. trying to figure that out. We'll see if that happens or not, but we'll yeah. we'll see. So, I love that. And yeah. and you have a new a new academy that you're. Yep. you know, Speaking of taking it to the next level, yeah. right? So, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I was I was um trying to get it where we're gonna give it to somebody else or get some of my my assistants to take over. And all of a sudden, my brother comes to me and said, "Oh, let's go buy this eighty acres of land and build a golf course." It's like really. So it's like, <laughs> let's just like, ramp no, this thing up. That's that's not a big deal. <laughs> so. Yeah, we have a new Shouldn't facility be. in Edmond, Oklahoma, that's um, which is golf mecca up here by the oak trees and you know some some of the best courses in the world. Um, we're building a training facility that's got six golf holes and a, a training indoor outdoor academy and an unbelievable practice short game area. I mean, we get we designed it all, so it's just gonna be, it's amazing. And hopefully by the summer of this year of twenty twenty four, we'll have the grass all growing in and we can get it open. That's what we're hoping. So we'll see how Mother Nature treats us. But yeah, oh, I'm really excited awesome. about that. Yeah, yeah, I I know I had a nice tour out there a few weeks yeah. ago and yeah. uh, on a on a oddly on a spectacularly beautiful winter day well i'm i'm sitting here today in middle of february end of february and it's 85 degrees out so this grass is wanting to go if we don't have a cold snap here in the next couple of weeks where it gets below freezing hard we'll probably get i would say by middle june we'll be good i mean ready to go if not That's it'll exciting. be july yeah so we'll see but we're excited yeah. very very excited and get us all under one umbrella and people can come in and have the ultimate training single plane experience training you can't you will not find better can't wow. i mean That's there's fantastic. no because there won't be any better practice facility in the country much less for single plane training so yeah yeah well that's great yeah. 
Well, Tim, I, I really appreciate the, uh, yeah. the time to do this. This is, uh, it's been enlightening for me. Um, <laughs> I've been, uh, you know, obviously we, we've done some, some fun, fun work together. We'll continue oh, yeah. to do that. I'm yep. looking forward to that, but it's fun to, to get to know some of the backstories here that, um, that I didn't really know all the, uh, all the details of. So that was really cool. Well, we have, um, I'll, I'll put in the plug for you and me on this one because I'm really looking forward to it. Cause just before I got on this podcast today, I, my, my school manager, James Bell called me up and said that we're almost full in our short game slash mental game school in June in Phoenix. Cause we're going to go out there. I don't think, oh, I, think right. I told you this, but we have a two day mental game school, the AI school. But just before that, I backed it up to a short game school. So we have a lot of guys who are just ecstatic right now, guys and gals, because they're going to come short game, mental game, short game, mental game. Now, if I get them in yoga right after that, we'd be rocking. <laughs> we could fill the week. That'll be exactly. Great. I mean, yeah. literally, we could, we could it'd be like a six great. days of the ultimate. Yeah. But um, no, so I'm really looking forward to seeing you. I'll be back on person with you in a couple months. I can't looking forward to that. That's great. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for uh, um, for spending time. Episode one, by the way, pretty exciting okay. stuff. Beautiful. And uh, we'll look forward to getting this out to to the golf community, the performance community. I think there's a ton of really cool and interesting uh, concepts and topics yeah. in here. So, Well, I'd love to do another one. It's great. So I had a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it, Tim. Thank you so Thanks. much. All right. Thank you, Tim Grace. Wow, that was incredible. Um, gosh, I, I mean, I'm just taking notes here like crazy. Had a chance to think about what Tim Tim was talking about and loved his ideas around focus, around getting comfortable with struggle. Um, love what Tim was saying about acceptance, not just on the golf course, but you know, can we bring acceptance into this changing human being that we're all walking around as, as we age, maybe can't hit those shots we did when we were 26. Love that, Tim. Um, I love the story about how he prepped for the Oklahoma City Amateur. When he was away for work in Atlanta, all he had was, you know, some crummy range balls and on a crummy range. And he had to revert to or focus on this, this visualization technique. And, you know, it's such a great story and it's such a, a, a powerful lesson on the, again, the power of visualization and what it can do for us. So love that story, Tim. Really, really terrific stuff. Um, and so I want to thank you, Tim, for, for being here for episode number one in the can, right? So, so for those of you uh, listening and, and, and watching, thanks so much for, for tuning into this episode of the most important game podcast. Once again, I'm Paul Monahan, and my mission is to help you lead, play and perform at your best by focusing on the inside game. If you want to learn more about the work that I do, you can visit me at my website, which is paulmonahan.com. There you can find my book, The Most Important Game, which is the very inspiration for this podcast. It's available in hardcover, paperback, uh, ebook, and audio as well. If you're watching on YouTube and you enjoyed this conversation, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. It goes a long way to helping me to bring new content and new episodes to you. And if you're listening to this podcast, please hit the follow button so you don't miss an episode. We have an incredible lineup of guests coming up this year, and I want to make sure that you don't miss an episode. And if you have any topics you'd like for me and my guests to address, drop me an email. I'm at paul at paulmonahan.com. Special shout out to our producer, Kevin Monahan. Thanks, Kev, for doing a great job behind the scenes today. Until next time, remember, don't give up. Stay in the game. No matter the arena that you're performing in, it is possible for you to play better, struggle less, and enjoy more.